just asking um, Rosso uh, before the meeting uh, where uh, our endow was, and in particular, the person I have um, intuited as founder of it, although our endow doesn't believe that there is a single founder, that there are co founders, but I intuited that it's probably Daniel in my reference system. And asking where our endow is right now and heard about a potential collaboration. And I asked Russell, well, what's the purpose from our endow's, Daniel's view and purpose? One of the main things I got was the, to be receiving funds or money. And I would just starting to explain that I've researched the relationship to money for 40 years and come to the point where um, I recognized that how one relates to money affects everything in life actually, including um, the choices that one makes in terms of um, work, family, and in the workplace, how the workplace is set up and just about everything in life, in fact. And with this realization, um, I tried to find some information for myself on how to understand what was happening in my relationship to money. This is 40 years ago, not being able to find that anybody had yet researched it, I did the research the original research process myself. And after a number of years, was able to diagnose anybody's relationship to money now, and particularly whether they are then, if they are not quite satisfied with where they are, how to develop it yet further to expand the relationship to money. So, um, I call this work my mo the money work and have an ecosystem of people who have taken part in this um, of several thousand and a practitioner's community that are trained in doing this work with other people of, of 100 or more practitioners at the moment in different countries. And the essence of it is to understand that money is like, our relationship to money is not something that we've been taught or educated in, in school or university or even business school. It's like uh, we're swimming in it, like a fish in water actually. And generally speaking, even those of us that are dealing with money systems, or in, in our endow's case, new token systems, we're looking at everything in terms of the system, but not what actually the tokens are doing with us or the money is doing with us. And um, the more we get into the development of money as a system, the more it disappears. And there's a new book in German, which is just out. Uh, you and may not be able to see the title very well, but German people can read, it's the philosophy of money in terms of its disappearance. So money, uh, according to the authors, money is coming into its perfect state right now, because up to now, you could, you could see it and touch it, but now it's actually disappearing the more virtually it becomes and as tokens, it disappears completely and becomes like, and we become even more like fish swimming in water and not seeing really what's going on. So the money work has um, developed so that you can see how you have money set up in your life and then how your organization, your company has it set up in your life. And to describe it very briefly and simply, um, what one can diagnose and analyze is that you're either, if you're not conscious, if you haven't done this study of what it's doing with you, your relationship to money is doing with you, you're either running after it or you're pushing it away from you 
or you're doing both at the same time. And to be able to diagnose yourself, you can do this very simply by looking at your bank account. If you're chronically in plus and trying to save and trying to get money, then probably you're running after it at a certain level. If you're chronically in debt, in minus and owing, you're probably, as some part of you is unconsciously pushing it away. You don't like money or you don't like people who are, have a lot of money, for example. And if you're doing both at the same time, the likelihood is that you're doing both of these things. You're running after money, running after money, running after money. And there's another part of you which is pushing it away at the same time. And I call this like the washing machine. And to understand this, and, and you know, your company or your organization, whatever it is, profit making or non profit making, is probably doing the same thing. And you're more or less aware of it. So, um, so to understand how this happens very simply, if, you, if, you're, if you're saying that money is something like security and you need money for your own security or you need money for your own freedom, you will automatically run after money thinking it will make you more, more money will make you more free and give you more security. But there's a problem there. You've lost your internal security, your internal freedom, and this puts you on a hamster wheel to run, to run, to run, to run, thinking when you've reached a certain threshold, you can stop running, but you will discover that when you reach that threshold, and if you will, if you're a successful person, uh, the threshold will have gone up and keep going up limitlessly. On the other side, if you don't like money, if it's, you've had painful experiences with it um, or with people with it, then you will be likely, without even realizing it, be pushing it away from you because money is a problem. Money is dirty. Money is evil. People with money are evil people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you'll find yourself in a continual shortage process. And actually, although you won't admit it, you'll be more comfortable being in debt than having savings and being one of these evil people. So, what we take out of this. And I'm giving you the clues which took me seven years to research is that money works in terms of your relationship. If you're not conscious of what you're doing, if you have it as the water like a fish and not, you haven't researched it yet, you will be in these patterns because these patterns were set up um, ages ago, but are particularly conditioned from by industrial society, which was started 350 years ago. And so they're in the collective water, they're in the collective space, these patterns, and they're not, and they're not noticed. So what's really happening is that if you say money is my security, you've lost your security, you're an insecure person who is running after money. And I have developed a process, which is what I call the money work, to help you reclaim your security and re-embody it, to help you reclaim your freedom, your happiness, embody all the things that are positive. If, you're run, if you claim that money is projected on, you know, your qualities that you're projecting onto money are positive, we can help you reclaim these to yourself. And then you're free. Because if you think money is freedom, you're not free, you're actually a prisoner of money. But when you're free, to be free, you have to be free with money and also without money, then you're free. On the other side, if money is dirty and evil, we help or, or is violent or something like that with you, we have to reclaim these qualities also. And I call these things that we don't like reclaiming qualities also because there are 
times when the, these things are really necessary. It's necessary um, to be heavy at times if we feel money is heavy. It's even necessary at times to be angry and violent. It's really helpful, particularly if we're dealing with angry and violent people, we may not know how to protect ourselves well. But we will, if we reclaim these, these what we think of as negative aspects to ourselves, we're very much more equipped for life. So this is, um, this is the money work. And I was not originally intending to make my life about it. But when I did the original research, I suddenly saw what is applying to me and my relationship to our money can also be extrapolated and applied immediately to companies, to initiatives, to projects. And, um, and go further to communities, to societies, to nations, and globally. And so what comes out of this, and this is why I invite people very strongly to look at their relationship to money, is that without this being done, and unfortunately it's not being done with, for example, yet with the IDGs, it's, it's left out. The whole relationship to money is not included yet there. We will not be able to realize the very, very good things that we have with good intentions without looking deeply into our relationship with money. It's no coincidence that this is a taboo subject in virtually every nation. Because within the relationship to money, we have the most deeply locked what Carl Gustav Jung called the shadow. It's in the relationship to money. So what we're dealing with here is very deep shadow work. And without dealing with this shadow, it, we, we find that money, whether we're running after it or we're pushing it away, gets in the way of what we want to realize. And so, you know, for an organization, let's take your organization, R and Dow, my very strong recommendation would be that uh, the members, uh, no matter in what position they are, look at their look into their relationship to money, starting from a founder or a group of founders downwards, um, because this will be absolutely essential for the realization of the nice values, the realization of the nice visions, et cetera, uh, that you have. And this applies to everybody and anybody who may be listening um, to, this, to this video, acknowledging that um, there's a timing aspect here. You might not feel ripe for this yet. It needs a certain level of consciousness and inner work already in advance to be willing to take this step, because if you feel into it now, try and feel into your relationship to money now, if you're watching this, and imagine that you would be sharing what you do with money with, a, let's say, a group of friends or a group of strangers even, and feel, would you really be willing to share this? Would you really be willing to talk about how much you've got in your bank account? Do you talk about this within, you know, within your circles? How transparent are you? What do you feel about it? Do you feel proud of your relationship? Do you feel shameful about your relationship? Look at your family, look at your parents, et cetera, et cetera. How, are the, how you know, what is the ecosystem of thinking that you have around your relationship to money? And what it is, what is this doing with you? What is it doing with your partnership, your marriage? How are you treating your children related to this? Their schooling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This goes deep, this goes far. And my suggestion is that without just starting to look at yourself with this, it's very, very, very difficult to realize your beautiful goals in life, your calling ultimately. 
So that's the money work. I will just very briefly touch on source work too. So the source work um, came to me quite a lot later after I'd started the money work because I'm from background, I'm a businessman and I was really interested to, to find out how we as business people realize our, our intentions, our goals and intentions. And to cut it short, I found out that we all do the same things. And, uh, and researched with more than hundreds of entrepreneurs to refine a description of what we all do when we realize our projects and dreams. And um, came to a number of principles around this. One of the principles, and in, an, in a setup like r and it's considered very controversial, but the first one I came up with, the first of 26 source principles, so I may only mention this one, is that in every initiative, every project, every enterprise, there is one founder. And where it is considered that there is more than one founder, uh, I and my practitioners are finding enterprises with, at some point, conflict and confusion. And we are, at the moment, um, doing more and more work helping founders sort out such situations where they consider there have been co-founders. So if you're in this room and thinking of starting something, you're in a better position than most to follow the source principles. Because if you've already started with co-founders, uh, it's much more difficult afterwards to make the correction um, when you discover it's really necessary uh, to do so in order to make your projects really realize. So the source work is actually the collective work that R and Dao would like in action. And it's collective work, starting with one founder and then having a second person come on board, third person on board, fourth person, up to tens, hundreds, and thousands of people, and how we organize ourselves when we want to realize a project. It defines the source principles are not a theory. It's actually empirical research in terms of a description which describes the order, an ordering plot process where in it, to enable that everybody is capable of living their power fully in the enterprise without stepping on each other's toes, without trying to exercise rights or responsibilities where they don't have rights or responsibilities in somebody else's field. So we, we define an order. We show the principles of collaboration, how people collaborate with each other within a field, which is set by a, a global founder. And then we give some help around the subject of succession and succession processes. So succession for a whole transmission of a whole organization a whole enterprise, but also, and very, very importantly, how to transfer within an enterprise. When somebody has started uh, and taken on a role and is excited by the role, but wants to move on to, to have another vision or another role somewhere else, what do they do? Do they just drop it or, can, or how do they pass it on in a sense that this other role, that the role keeps, stays alive? To another person. So that's a very quick summary of the description of the source principles. And um, I know that several of us here in this room actually uh, know about this because they've, you know, encountered and more or less deeply are into this work. But I think that's a good point just for me to stop and take, um, take any questions that come up for the rest of the time. And I see there's already one. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Alex? Yes. 
Thank you. Uh, first of all, Peter, very admirer of your work. Uh, yeah, happy to to coincide. Um, so I have a question about the source work, um, specifically, how do you balance the amount of power that you let this person uh, have in a formal structural way? So just to give like a quick intro. Uh, so I, I noticed that in both cases, in both extremes, both uh, a group where the source doesn't acknowledge that he or she is the source and or uh, uh, a group where the source acknowledges so much that it seems that he or she can take decisions just because of that. Uh, so I understand there must be a balance. And my hypothesis is that uh, maybe trying to, considering that this is not an operational role, but something that is like living in a different layer, um, I guess we should avoid giving more structural authority to a, a person who already is a source. We're talking here, the substrate of what you're talking about is power. Um, the source person, uh, let's, I, I ask everybody looking, whether you like the idea or not, just to put on a, like spectacles for the moment, because uh, we will look at and, and assume that the, the found, there is one founder in, in the example we're looking at. And, and there are other people, many other people, but there's one founder who started the enterprise from nothing. So we're calling that person the global source of the founder. And, and your question is around the power that this person has related to all the other people. So um, I like to define power as the ability to act. And actually what we want is that everybody in the field all the people have the ability to act. The question is on what and when. So the global source has the power to act in the sphere of responsibility or field of responsibility which they have created, which that person has created, which is the whole. So in the source principles, the source has power, authority, and responsibility for everything happening in the field. I have responsibility for everything happening in my field because nobody else created it. I did. And I need help. I can't do everything on my own. So the second person that comes in and the third person that comes in and the fourth person that comes in who are attracted by my values, attracted by my vision, come in and help me. Now they help in specific ways in my field. And when they come in, they become sources of their particular field within my field. Within their particular field, I have no say at all because they are the source of their particular areas within my field. The only thing I can say to them is what you're doing fits in my field. Please stay and do it or, it or something you're doing doesn't fit in my field in which I say, I don't say don't do it. I say, please take this part and do it outside my field because I want to see everybody around doing everything they want to do to fulfill their calling whether it's in my field or it's not in my field. So I have power over my part, they have power over their part. And the nature of the relationship where we are equals is that we can challenge each other about our clarity. So I allow my specific or subsources to challenge me. If I take a decision in my part and they feel I'm not clear, 
I'm very happy that they come to me and challenge me because I don't want to take any decision where I'm not clear. So they have equal power with me in that level. But equally, I have power, and everybody in my field has power to challenge everybody else around the subject of clarity. So that is where there's equality. But there is not equality around decision-making in anybody's specific field. I take full responsibility for the decision-making for the whole. They take res full responsibility for the decision-making in their parts, and I have no responsibility or no action around that. So if somebody in my field says we have offices and they say, in my area, the, the carpets are red and I hate red carpets, I have nothing to say, you understand? So what we're talking about is not that I have power over another person and I'm pushing them to do everything that I think is right. It's really a cooperative sharing of power and we're all equals in the ability to challenge each other, but everybody is also equal globally in the sense that anybody can start a new project. There's nobody that is telling somebody they must come into my field. If they don't want to, they can start on their own and be the number one if they want to. And so to summarize, I am number one in my global field, but I love putting myself in other people's fields and being number two, number three, number five, number six as well. I might even, you know, if I'm, I find RN Dao really cool, I might put myself into Daniel Ospina's field and start doing something there if I feel that that will help me with my vision. So the role of a global source is actually, to summarize now, is actually to help the other people in the global sources field to remain true and live their visions and their values. And that's how, that's how this works with source principles. And we're a, we're, my field is a, continuing, a continual and continuing experiment on that basis. So that, does that respond and answer to your question? So yes and no. So thank you and, and yeah, I'll, be, I'll try to be quick. So I agree with everything you said, and I aspire to be in a team where I can feel that sense of balance. Uh, I think I am, my question is more about the structural roles, like operational roles. So let's make a, 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 um, a scenario where you have like a um, early stage group, let's say 10 people. So you only have one field, or maybe you have some others, but they are all, all they are just beginning and um, in this first circle of operations you need to have different roles of delegation of authority of decision making right i am no 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 this is the traditional way normal way it's set up just so to be clear i i am coming from sociocracy when you where you try to push those roles in, the, in and distribute them in, within the group. But like you, you still need someone who is coordinating or you still someone who is facilitating. So I understand that the idea, at least in, in sociocracy, is to push and try to make these different people. But so, so I start, you know, we, we, we start very simply, like starting a dinner party. Do you, when, you, when you're organizing a dinner party, do you, do you immediately come with people having different roles or, or cooking for people in the evening? So we're, we're starting in the same way. I don't know. I just say, this is my vision. This is, this is, I want to do a dinner party, and, but I can't do it on my own. Who would like to help? Then somebody comes in and says, well, I'm very good at frying. And somebody else says, I'm good at cutting vegetables. And I'm, somebody else comes in and says, I haven't a clue what I need at that point. I just have an idea of the vision and what I want to create. Now, in a, in a normal setting, 
we have somebody who is responsible for human resources somebody so you you know what you're describing is the normal pattern so we already we're already right after the start of setting up a, of, of me starting i'm already have a mental set of shortage you understand and then you're short all the time if you come on that from that basis i come from the point there's nothing missing at any moment there's nothing missing all i need to do is focus on my vision and what i want to realize and that will draw what i need and every single startup starts that way actually including our endow i can guarantee you that daniel ospina if he is the source and i believe he is started that way has a vision of something that doesn't yet exist explains the vision attracts people and nobody knows what their roles are going to be right at the start. So very often, the number two, the number one, the source is somebody who's like a visionary, and the number two is somebody who says, oh, I can help, I'll deal with the operations. It's not always that way. And then the third and the fourth people come. So that's, that's the way. And your notion of balance, I don't, believe, I don't believe in balance. It's not about balancing anything. It's about, it's about seeing that everybody is fully in their, fully in their calling and their power and loving what they do. That's the, that's the management. It's not about balancing. But if you're not, just to come back to your point, if you're not fully taking this position yourself, and this is the danger of co-founders. And you might look at, if you're watching this and you're part of Iron Dow, you might look at what, if this is not happening here, if Daniel's not or somebody who is founder is not taking their position, what will happen is you get usurpation coming up. Usurpation, what does that mean? It means that the parts of the founding role will be occupied by somebody else because they will feel that that's missing. And at some point that will lead to a conflict amongst the founders because the founder, the, 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 the source is not fully standing in their their full power and something is missing there, somebody else will step in and take it until there's a clash in values. And that's, you know, we're doing a lot of work uh, in our field of helping people to sort that out, particularly around, uh, particularly with many examples of sociocracy and, and holacracy, which are brilliant ideas, but need the source principles to make them really work effectively. So I've, I hope that that's, uh, that's sufficient because I see we've got another hand up while the time is still here. Yes, yes, thank you. Bazir? Thank you, Peter. Uh, we, we are trying to explore the outer space, the interstellar, but I think our human mind, uh, the human dimension, the society has so much more things to discover. And thank you for all the, your discoveries. So bless you. My question is about uh, how do you get the momentum, number one, meaning when it rains, it pours, that kind of an acceleration. And second question, just uh, what are some of the best cases that you absolutely love? So you know, you're spreading these wonderful seeds and you're certainly cultivating, motivating and uh, encouraging and maintaining your mentorship. So as in progression, what are some of your best cases? Thank you. So can you repeat the first question again? So uh, the, the first question specific? is, uh, how do you get the momentum? Like, what, you know, what, when what, what do you mean by that exactly? By once you initiate the action, is there a way to accelerate it beyond it beyond the normal targets? Or how do you get uh, how do you get to achieve breakthroughs in the launch or in the progression? Or how do you catapult? I'm not sure I do. <laughs> the next question, please. Your best cases. <laughs> I, I mean, um, if you're looking at acceleration, the what I call the reclamation work and explained before is an accelerator of human personal development. So um, very often, the problem we come up with in systems and developing our organizations is we meet resistance. So 
If you're looking for acceleration where you meet resistance, the reclamation work is very effective. So we, 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 we can ask the person, you know, we can notice the resistance and we can see what they are projecting, find out what they're projecting. And when we get them, ask them, and then we're, if, we're, if we're successful in getting them to reclaim that, what they're projecting, then it, it smooths the way forward. And that can be done very quickly. It sometimes takes time, but people don't necessarily need to go into deep therapy or, or have you know, year long coaching for that. We can do it sometimes in minutes. So that's an accelerator if you're looking for an accelerator. Reclamation, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, in terms of examples, um, one of the examples I will give uh, where there a company that is working here in Switzerland, where I live, uh, working with source and with money work to a degree, reclamation work to a degree. I don't claim any perfection at all because we're, in, we're always in a moving dynamic, experimental moving forward. But one of the most advanced companies is called For You and Your Customers here who have um, taken on pretty well the source principles, uh, are, using, are using very unusual for most normal companies, ideas of expansion, for example, have a maximum, um, when they have a branch of 30 people, they don't expand anymore. Uh, they look at who wants to, who would want to open a new branch and they go wherever there is somebody ripe enough to open a, a new branch to open it and expand, for example. Um, uh, so they are working in that way with the with with source principles, like a, in a very cellular, um, natural way, like nature. And in fact, the source principles, in my view, are like an um, like a mirror of nature. We're trying to mirror here how nature works in terms of the, the result being actually what so many initiatives want in terms of a working collective. And there's a paradox here because to get the working collective, you need the individuality of every single plant, every single, every single worm, every single ant, you know? We're not trying to pretend that we're all the same. We, we're, we're, we're encouraging the individuality and at a certain moment of emergence there is a sense of collectivity but it doesn't come from saying we're collective to start off with and having some ideological view of co collectivity which we're looking to to manufacture is that thank you very much very enlightening thank you truly thank you that thank you very much Devin. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to ask you if you think and how you think money influences the dynamics of this model you're describing. Uh, which one now? The one of for you and your customers, or no, 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 of of the, of DAO of the organi of the organization because you talked earlier about yeah, yeah? Okay. okay so. Um, so one of the things I discovered, I'm going to go a little bit around about, but it'll be sufficient. Um, one of the things I discovered is that what founders do, every founder, including myself, has a pathology. And uh, I use the word pathology consciously. What I'm really saying is, has some things they still got to develop. But I like to use the word pathology because it's so clear. So, so every founder attracts people with the same pathology and at the same time, the polarity of that, the opposite of that, that quality or pathology. And so the founder's pathology 
will be driving the whole organization, actually. So in other words, let's say that, for example, that Daniel has two things. And I hope he's watching this because <laughs> he can answer this if it's true or not. Let's say that on one side, Daniel. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, Daniel is here, by the way. Oh, hi, Daniel. So you can answer this. Hey, Peter. <laughs> Welcome. So if Daniel, if you, for example, and, and uh, I'm grateful you're here. So if you have a, a feeling that money is security, then you will be running after money and your organization will be running after money for its security. But if on the other hand, at the same time, you don't like money really, and you don't like capitalists, you don't like greedy people who have lots of money, then there will be part of you which is also pushing money away at the same time. And you will find that your organization will be doing the same thing. Your organization will be running after money on the one hand, and on the other side, you'll be pushing it away. And so, the mon so there'll be this, like I call it, like a washing machine process taking place, not only in your own life, but actually in the whole organization, because you've attracted people who have this same kind of what I'm calling pathology to make it simple. It's actually, you know, I'm not criticizing that. It's just another thing that we have to develop. Mm. So that's yeah. how we can see what's going on and how it relates to organizations as well in enterprises. Yeah, I mean, the, I can very much relate to Arundel's history. Uh, at the beginning, we started very much with this mission of empowering humane collaboration, and it was not very clear, like the sort of values or principles that we were following. And there ensued a very heavy co uh, conflict in between a desire to make it commercially sustainable and on the other side, a desire to push really strongly for the humane part and be very radical in that area, uh, irrespective of any commercial viability or suggesting that that would, through mimifying it and launching a token of some sort, that the community would rally and become valuable in its own right, which were two competing visions that led to a deep conflict between those of us who started it and eventually a division into two factions and one faction finally leaving, after which the organization became a lot more streamlined and peaceful, and we have been making a lot more progress. Great. But it cost us dearly. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you being, for sharing that. That's very, very valuable. Um, how about your relationship to money and the relationship to the, to the enterprise's money, as that was the question? Yeah, I think I'm a, I'm generally a, I'm a passionate builder, so I'm sacrificing my own personal finances uh, systematically in favor of building the organization. And I will rather hire more people and do something to advance the vision rather than uh, generating a, a healthy cash flow for myself. Uh, if that meant the organization maybe would grow less or would have less resources to advance its thing. So... Yeah, I have had that sort of somewhat imbalanced relationship, I think, uh, with it for a long time that now I'm trying to remedy a little bit. But and then, yeah, meanwhile, the me, well, the organization chasing after money is very much happening. Uh, but is I feel in good part is me doing it while others sort of benefit from the comfort that is me doing it. Mm -hmm. So the message for you is that you're your enterprise is probably doing the same thing as you. So in other words, when you, gener when you feel that you are generating sufficiently, then the enterprise will automatically have that same feeling of generating sufficiently. Is this, is this making sense? So this is where the the organizational work gets really personal. It comes back to the founder um, to do the, the basic work because as I'm suggesting, it's the founders, what I'm calling pathology, which is actually attracting the people in the field and the, the people who are the opposite. 
So when the founder does the work, he's doing it, he or she is actually doing it for everybody in the field at a certain level. It, it changes the whole dynamic in the field, which is why we like to work with my work with the founders or people as close to the founders as possible. But ultimately for any, for the change, the, the, the advancement to take place, it needs to take place with the founder, um, certainly in the process. Uh, of of this of this kind of development. So, um, so the the simple way, and I give you the the simple process here to share. To, I share that with you is, and with everybody here in the room, is to ask yourself very simply. Write down what is money for you. In and without too much thinking, write it down in, in two, three, five, or 10 words or phrases. And notice, notice that that's what you're projecting onto money. Notice that they, these qualities are what you're projecting onto money. And these qualities are actually what are missing in you to help you realize what you want to be realizing, whether you judge these qualities as positive and whether you judge them as negative. Because you weren't here, Daniel, at the beginning, I think, when I was describing the money work, we value really a lot of the negative qualities here too, because they are very important. We judge them as positive. You know, things like, you know, I mean, it's a bit radical and sounds crazy to some people, but for example, it's very important to be able to be violent on occasion, but consciously violent, not unconsciously violent. To be, let's call it, you know, if you say money is dirty, it's very important to be able to be dirty at some time. Otherwise, you're likely to be taken by the mafia, who are dirtier than you. You know, it's like, there's nothing that we ultimately judge as uh, negative or unimportant because these are all parts of our humanity and to really realize our projects with ease we need to reclaim all parts of our humanity to be able to express them and then to project them again onto money but consciously so this is ultimately uh, if this is my ultimate summary this is really consciousness work that we're doing with money and source Thank you, Peter. And I think this is a great way to end this talk. We are on the hour. Uh, so thank you, Peter, for coming here. And thank you, everyone from the audience. Um, great, great pleasure. Yeah. Anyone who wants to see more of this, please join us on our Discord. Thank you um, for leading this so well. And I just want to put in a little note about sense making. Um, a quotation I heard last week from Daniel Schmachtenberger, whom some of them, some of you may know, who said, "You can't do sense making without sensing." And I just throw that in because I think that is the key <laughs> to sense in order that you can have sense making. Thank Amazing. you. I love you all. <laughs>